I, I think the way things are right now, I, I think we're totally in agreement here. Five or six game series, Sixers are not the team that scares me the most. I mean, I think that's easily the Bucks, but then I think the Cavs actually probably scare me a little bit more than Philly does, but that might just be a little bit of the unknown. Yeah, so I've been scouting the Cavs. I'm not even going to lie. Yeah, tell me. Um, I mean, I said, like, I, th- I think that my biggest concern, and I said this on a, um, an episode last week, actually, was my biggest concern is the way they utilize Evan Mobley, right? Yeah. And the way they put him in the corner when they're playing offense. So now all of a sudden they're take. So what happens is you put one of your most impactful big men defenders, which is usually Al Horford, and you put him on Mobley. And now the Cavs are going to put Mobley in the corner and ask Mobley to stretch the floor or they'll run some flex offense to get him coming into the post or whatever it may be. But he starts out in a half-court offense in the corner um, quite frequently. And all of a sudden, your defense is just stretched apart. And then Donovan Mitchell just gets a nice little back screen or a sight or a pick and roll or whatever. And there's no king like key rim protector down there. Now, I think Boston have the ability to kind of counteract that with Robert Williams in the dual mm-hmm. big lineup. But the downside is they also have Jarrett Allen and they run dual big lineups a lot of the time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that one little caveat, little, little, little bit of Spider-Man meme right there with the two front cords. Yeah. But that one little caveat of having Mobley go out into the corner just changes the the composition of your defense, right? Because you have to account for him. He's got too much height to reliably expect a Marcus Smart or a Brogdon to guard him because he's just going to shoot over you and he is a value like he's a viable three-point scoring big man. So you really want to keep a big on him to be physical, to stay in his sh- shooting space, to kind of deter that shot. But then you're taking one of your rim protectors away and they've still got Jarrett Allen that's a vertical threat. And now it's just who jumps higher this time versus Robin J.A. And it's just tough, right? And I think yeah. that Cleveland are built more in in the way to give Boston problems because of the little caveats like having, Mo- put, being, having the option to put Mobley in the corner, running horn sets with two big men one that can pop with like doing a lot of stuff that boston do right yeah they they can put horford and rob in a horn set rob rolls horford pops so can cleveland like there's just so many like similarities between the two teams i the only thing is i just think boston's that bit more experienced they've got that bit more high-end talent i think yeah, both teams the are deep. yeah I, I don't see i don't know the if level I... right yeah, at the high end, Cleveland's deep because their 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 top four can match up with any four in the league, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that, it's that. that's where it is. It's that next level down that I don't think they have, and that's a little bit in the you know in the Philly Boston sense where I just listed you know Derek White, Malcolm Brogdon, Robert Williams, all these guys that you are adding into addition to your stars, to your defensive player of the year, to your two All NBA guys, and so that's where I think there's there's a little bit of difference. And you mentioned you know the experience. I think the part for you know, you covered most of the reasons why I think Cleveland is it's, it's just a matchup thing more than yeah, anything it's, else. There's just so much more, like, like you said, it's that Spider-Man meme, but it's not just mm-hmm. the, t- the players, it's the, the design of the roster is so similar. Mm-hmm. I do think, though, that this could bleed into what you wanted to speak about with Derek White and to another extent, Malcolm Brogdon, yeah. is that secondary depth, that second tier depth with Grant Williams thrown into that discussion as well. Um, you know, you could add Muscala in there. If you need more three-point shooting, you can add keep Al in there. Whatever you want to do, right? That second-tier depth is just so much more experienced, so much more veteran savvy, and uh, uh, bluntly, so much more talented yeah. than what Cleveland's second-tier depth is. That's where the advantage comes. But does that get you out of a series in five games, six games, seven games? How much more valuable is that depth as teams start to get yeah. so much film on you and so much familiarity of what you're doing? So I think with Cleveland, the the one, and then Greg and I had talked about this, the the unknown part with them, number one, a little bit of the experience, but we know Donovan Mitchell is a big time playoff production player. Like we know, yeah, we we know that he's not going to be afraid to say, oh, Jalen, you're going off tonight. Bet. Let's match. You know, same to Jason Tatum. He's going to say, all right, you want to do a 40 for 40 club? Let's go hit Jay-Z. Let's do the 40 40 club tonight. Let's let's go. I'll, I'll match you with that. The the part that is is kind of the mystery of the Cavaliers is does Evan Mobley just make that leap? Greg and I talked about this in the yeah. last episode. Is, is this when Mobley just decides, oh, hey, I'm going to tell the world this is my moment that I'm making the leap? Maybe it's not till next year. Who knows? But that's the thing. You don't know, right? You don't know until you know. And so if that's that moment, 
and the Celtics get, you know, a little bit banged up and it cuts into that, you know, the disparity and the depth, all of a sudden you may have yourself a very different situation. So that's where I think it gets a, a little bit interesting with the Cavs. 